Welcome to Love Light, the only podcast dedicated to bright, fine art photography. Hosted by Sarah Jane Ethan, Love Light is here to celebrate all things bright, pretty and pastel. At Love Light, white is the new black and beauty is in the detail. This is your place to relax, a place to belong, a place to be inspired and connect with like-minded colleagues who share your passion for light and beauty. So come and introduce yourself in the Love Light Facebook group and subscribe to the Love Light YouTube, podcast and Instagram for your weekly dose of inspiration and connect with bright, fine art photographers from around the world. Well, hello and welcome to another Love Light podcast. Today, we've got a very special guest because we've got Darcy Beniscoza here. Darcy is an incredible photographer. She's a world a renowned international photographer and an industry leading expert in marketing, mindset and motivation for creative entrepreneurs. She's worked for Sports Illustrated magazine and her work and her teaching have been featured in the Huffington Post, Martha Stewart, Out magazine, ABC, NBC, The, New, the View and Upworthy. She took her small startup photography business with just one camera and one lens from $16,000 to $120,000 in revenue in just 11 months. So now she educates, um, consults and inspires thousands of photographers whilst also building, founding three six-figure businesses in the past decade. So I am so excited to talk to you, Darcy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I do, I know that you've just got a wealth of wisdom and experience and I'm really excited, but can you give us a little insight into how you even got started in photography? That sounds like quite a story. You had one camera, one lens and a, and a big dream. <laughs> Well, that's how I started my business. When I started photography, I didn't even have a camera that had a separate lens. I had this 35 millimeter Canon, you know, camera. And I, I got started when I moved to Paris, like in more earnest. So I was always very interested. My grandmother was a painter and I started learning painting from her and photos were so much faster. <laughs> she would, we would spend hours painting and create this image. And she really taught me, you know, about seeing color and light and all of that. And so I always loved composition and art. And when I moved to Paris, I was really lonely and I just had this camera. So I would go out, this was before cell phones, everybody, because yeah. I'm in my forties. So I moved to Paris uh, 10 days after Princess Diana was killed, which was a really interesting time to be coming into Paris. There was a lot going on in the world and I knew no one. So I would walk for miles a day, no iPhone, no cell phone, just this little camera. And I would try to recreate these old 1940s black and white cafe photos that I saw. And um, so that's kind of how the love for photography got started. My business got started when I bought a $400 Nikon D700 from a, a friend, a, a friend's uncle who was a photographer and he was upgrading his camera. So he gave me a, quite a deal. And that is when the business started to happen. I started to actually start charging money, but that was a decade after moving to Paris. So I didn't get started in my business till I was in my 30s. Um, so there's hope, everybody. If you're a late bloomer like I am, <laughs> there's hope about starting a really profitable business in your 30s, um, even in your 40s. I'm I'm all about going for it whenever the calling comes to you. I love that, and I'm the same. Actually, I started photography when I was 31 or 32. Yeah, so, awesome. Yeah, so that's the same. Yeah, I love that. And so now you had quite um quite a, a steep rise in your business that you kind of yeah. within the first 11 months you had yeah. achieved a revenue that most photographers struggle for years to yeah. achieve. So talk to me about like what what do you think was the key elements that actually created that level of success for you? So the job I had before I left was I was teaching school and every day during lunch, I would kind of get into my office and watch these motivational videos like you, you and I were talking about Will Smith, like changed my life. And he, you know, he was just like, go for your plan A. And I realized I had really evolved out of teaching school. It wasn't where I was going to, my income was always going to be capped. Right. So with a government job, no matter how good I was, no matter how many hours I put into this school teaching, which I put a ton in because I was directing musicals and I wasn't, you know, as a teacher, they're always like, do it for the good of the kids. They never really pay you for all your extra hours. You just get this $50,000 salary a year, which is probably like 30, 
thousand pounds a year. And, um, I just realized I would never, never break out of that. Mm -hmm. And that as I did my mindset work and I did work on expanding my soul and on what creating a dream life, I was like, I'm going to have to leave this career if I want the wealth and the life that I want, which was to travel, to be everywhere, to never have to take a sick day to go, you know, just do something I really loved. You know, I wanted freedom. That's my whole motivation in my life is having absolute freedom and liberation. So um, when I finally left the day job in 2013, I freaking did not hold back. I mean, I had so much ambition and I had been planning this. I knew I was going to leave school teaching. So the year before I left, which was the year that I made $16,000 in it, um, I started studying marketing and I started studying marketing, not from photographers because Mm -hmm. photographers are not that good at it. (laughs) Yeah. creatives in general love creating, but they don't like selling or marketing their work. They get very embarrassed by it. So I did a bunch of work in that regard. And then I put together my marketing map is what I call it. I now have a course called the marketing map with everything that I did because I started doing some very specific campaigns marketing campaigns. And tell me if I'm going into much depth because I can answer. I don't think you can go into too much depth. I think we're all questioning. (laughs) This question I could answer for like two hours. I could really go in depth. So I'm trying to think of how I can, but I started some marketing campaigns, which means I put together some really powerful um, shoots on my own. I, I styled them. I collaborated. I sent many, many emails. I called in lots and lots of favors. And a lot of people said no. And a lot of people said yes. And, um, through those few shoots, uh, my business got very well known very quickly. Now I have been shooting as a photographer for many years, you know, since Paris. So my style was really good. And I had always shot film because like I said, I'm in my forties. So I, I kind of landed on the film photography scene with these beautiful, um, with these beautiful shoots. And then I marketed them like crazy. Like I could go through exactly how I did that, which is a very detailed process. And, um, and that just, you know, booked me. And then I just hustled instead of asking like, how am I going to pay my bills? I started asking myself, how can I make $10,000 a month this month and have fun? And that was a big key. I had to have fun I love that. because I had not had fun <laughs> in my past job the last few years. And when you ask your brain the right questions, Mm -hmm. it really does come up with the answer. Mm -hmm. So I did a bunch of things to make that money. I worked for a university doing stock photos. One month, like the first month I asked myself that question, I put on these mini sessions and I did a great marketing that was more, um, it wasn't like Facebook ads. It was all word of mouth, all referral base. And I made, I ended up making $12,000 by the end of my first month doing that. That was my first self-employed month, $12,000. When as a school teacher, I had been bringing home 3,000 every month after taxes. So anyway. I love that. And I really love the fact that you said, how can I do it and have fun? And I think that is a bit that most people miss and they think, oh, I want to be a photographer because it's going to bring me freedom. Because you said freedom is a big thing of your life. Yeah. But then if you're not having fun, it becomes its own prison that you become a slave to the to the monster that you've created. <laughs> and it and it's not it's not fun anymore. So I really love that that right from the start you were like, it has to be fun or else this is this is no kind of life for me. I really love that. Yeah, I think before I did that, I did a lot of mindset work because mm. creatives are their own worst enemy. They can get to major extremes. They can get down on themselves so much. They can forget to have fun. They can, you know, they can get out of their creative flow when they're worrying about the business side. And some people, some creatives are so good at creativity and then they really struggle to run a business and Mm. they, they kind of make an enemy of the business. And I really, really wanted to fall in love with my business. I love that. And that has very much been my, my mindset from the start. I was like, it's got to work for my life or else it's ruining my life. It's not adding to my life. And I really love that. And And I know that that everything is roses. No, (laughs) I I have bad days for sure. There's a difference between a challenge that you're excited to 
to face and a challenge that just makes you feel like you're dying a little bit inside and and yeah just, yeah it's like if the challenge if you're daily showing up and you're upset and frustrated and sad and don't feel like you're worth it and don't feel like you're going to make any money that is a mindset thing mm -hmm. if you if you are positive and you're working on it and you still have bad days or you, you F up a shoot, you know, I don't know if I can say the F word, but F up a shoot, mess it up. You know, if you do that, that's just being a human, you know, like you're going to have those mistakes. You're going to have those issues. You're, you're going to have days where you do think of quitting, but if it's a daily grind, that's when you need to really assess the mindset and, and what you're really doing. And if you really want to be doing it or not, because some creatives, just get to can just have a hobby being creative and figure out another way to make money you know it's it's yeah. really a depend it depends on the person absolutely and I think there's no shame you know in keeping it as a small cottage industry or just as a, as a paid hobby you know like whatever works for your life it that's that's what works for you I love that I know that you said that meditation and mindset are like are really important to you and that they are for me as well I think I have discovered myself that I think the source of all stress in my life always is rooted in a have to, have to be, mm. have to do, have to get, um, have to be, have to do, have to get. And actually, I, I thought for a long time, well, how do I get out of this? Because the reason I'm getting stuck in this, I have to, I have to do it like this, or I have to be this, or I have to, is because I think I have to, do you know? So how do I stop myself <laughs> thinking that I have to? And so the, the way I changed it around, I just switched the words around from have to, to to have. And I would ask myself, what do I have? What is in me to do today? And if I've done by the end of the day, everything that was in me to do that day, then I've won. And it doesn't matter whether technically it m measures up to what I think it should have been or what I think, you know, it doesn't matter. I won because I did everything that was in me to do that day. Can you talk me through some of the mindsets and things that you've done that have helped you stay on track and keep loving your life and your business? <sighs> yeah. I mean, one, it's not shoving anything under the rug, right? So a lot of times I think in our society, we we feel we have to, like you said, mm. we have to be happy. We should be positive. We should make everybody happy. Like, so, so I think it's one, like getting really in touch with what you actually desire yeah. in your life to having really, really strong boundaries. So one, I always say, know thyself. You need to know what you want, mm -hmm. not what anybody else wants for you. Yeah. I grew up in a situation where my parents had lots of ideals for my life that I ended up having to break away from and it disappointed them greatly. So wow. disappointing your parents is like awesome. Everybody <laughs> needs to do it. Disappointing your spouse, disappointing your friends. One, you know, really deciding what is the life you want wow. and becoming very committed to that. And then what will come after that are boundaries. So one thing that has helped me a lot is guarding what I say yes to and what I say no to. And I say no a lot more, but that makes it so when I say yes to something, I can really, really do it and do it really well. Yes. Instead of trying to say yes to everything, please, everybody always be overwhelmed. Um, three, getting a lot of sleep. I used to not sleep very much because I was trying to build this like million dollar business. And that really messed me up with my help long-term. So I sleep is a priority. So when it comes bedtime, no matter if I still have photos left to edit, I turn it off. And I used to never do that before. I would stay up all night and be like, I just need to get it done tonight. And, um, and I make sure I don't overschedule myself now so that I can do that. Um, meditation and visualization. So meditation is when I'm clearing my mind or just allowing, I, I practice transcendental meditation 20 minutes, twice a day. And then I do a 10 minute visualization every morning with what is my visualization right now? It's my house. Like I visualize cause I'm remodeling my house. So I visualize this home I want to create because where I live actually influences the type of work that I pr produce. Like I, and I don't know if, if you're the same, I have to live in a pretty place. Like I have to live in an aesthetically beautiful. I want objects of beauty around me. I want things that I care about. Um, and I don't care if it takes me a slower time to 
get what I want. I'd rather not have it than fill it with a bunch of stuff that doesn't inspire me. So keeping that inspiration alive, but those are just a couple. I mean, yeah, there's so much journaling. I've done a lot of therapy work. I've gotten rid of trauma. I've looked at trapped emotions. Mm -hmm. I've done the emotion code. I, if I have a difficult emotion come up, I realize that that is just as, um, that's just as beautiful as a positive emotion and you get to work your way through that. And as an artist, I think it affects your art too. Wow. I love that. That's, it's been very much my journey. Um, it's interesting. I think we're similar ages. It sounds like we've kind of gone through um, what I call the big squeeze where you, you kind of leave behind the, the first part of life where you're trying to figure out who you are based on external things. And then you enter yeah. the second half of life where you figure out, okay, those are all external things. Who am I actually on the inside? And exactly yeah. like you, I've, I've really learned to embrace my unpleasant emotions and realize actually they're really valuable. They're like guides that are telling yeah. me things about the world around me and what I like and what I don't like and what's beneficial for me and what's harmful for me. So that that's amazing. And um, so I really love that. So can you can we go back? Because I, I, I do actually want to talk to you more about um, your your journey in in men, uh, mentality and spirituality as well as I'm really interested in spirituality. But can you tell us? You said I can go into my marketing plan. You know how I actually I, you did these incredible shoots um, co- collaborating with people. You had to have the hardness to to take the knockbacks when you were getting lots of no's, but then you got enough yeses to to put these shoots together, and then you just got out there marketing yourself. Can you talk us through what that looked like? Yeah. So a lot of creatives think that all the work goes into creating beautiful images, right? Every photographer thinks if I take beauty and are most of your listens, listeners, photographers, do you have a bunch of different kinds of creatives? Yeah. So they're all photographers and they're all bright okay. and airy um, style. Okay. Photographers. Awesome. Well, I am too. So um, we think that creating the perfect image is going to get a scene and every, you know, and and truthfully, that's the easiest part. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. And, and we think it's the hardest part, like getting the mood board, getting the venue, getting all these things. So as soon as I had the shoot, I was astounded by how many people, even if they got it published, would just like get it published and and then put one link up to it and be like, oh, I got this publication and put the little logo on their website. Oh, I was in, I was on One Sweat or I was on Style Me Pretty. And um I knew that was just the beginning. So every time, so we, I did it very strategically. So we got it in, um, on style me pretty first. Cause at, at that time, 2013, style me pretty was the place to be. And then I put a whole campaign around that, meaning I got every single vendor to get at least 10 people to come and comment so that style me pretty felt like, Oh my gosh, look at all these comments we're getting. Right. And, um, got a lot of traction for it and then let it sit there for about two or three months. And then I marketed it in, in Europe and I got it in a publication in Europe. And then I submitted it to a magazine in Ireland and I got it in a magazine in Ireland, which, um, then caused me to book another wedding in Ireland, which was magical and so much fun. And I really love Ireland. So it was so great to go back there and I've shot many weddings there, um, And then after that, I put it back in another American publication with each publication. I told them, Hey, it has been published before, but it was such a great shoot and enough time had passed. So basically for a two year period, I got this shoot published again and again. Then I put it on Pinterest with pins to my blogs, which, um, which I was getting traction from then. And, um, everybody knows the shoot. They know me for it. They've seen, they've seen it when they see the images, they're like, that's a Darcy shoot, you know? And I still, that was shoot was done in 2013. I still love the photos from it. Cause that's the beauty about bright and airy photography is that we stay really close to natural light. So our photos stay, um, timeless where the reason I don't like using the presets is because they date themselves and they mark themselves. And you look back three years in the past and think, how in the world did I edit that like that? Like that's why I'm all bright and airy all the way, because even the shoot in 2013 shot on Fuji film and I still shoot Fuji film. It still looks beautiful. Now my talent has gotten better, of course, but that shoot. So that's just part of it. That's just a part of the marketing is not letting it end with a tiny publication. A lot of people don't even go after publications anymore because they think, 
they're pointless, but I don't think so. I think that there's still a lot of value in it if you work it the right way. And I think there might be an Instagram live video on my YouTube channel where I really go in depth about what I did with these marketing campaigns. So I will try and get that link and you can yes. give the link to your guests to go listen to that because I take, I mean, I just summarized it pretty quickly, but I take that and really kind of go into depth there for like that 40 be, minutes. So. Yeah, that would be brilliant. That would be yeah. so helpful. Yeah, like yeah, that is a, that's a great way of looking at it. Actually, how can you maximize? Because you put so much effort into creating the shoot. And yeah. Then, you know, then just let it go. Oh, I right, just post and then it. And just then... let it sit there and let a few images go out and maybe yeah. get a few tags on Instagram. And now with Instagram stories, you should, with every vendor involved, plan the day that you're going to all post about it and you all need to tag each other and you need to put at least 10 photos and you need to only work with people who will do this because I used to work with very famous people and then I realized they have all the work they need. They were not very inclined to photograph the, they were not very inclined to share photos. They might share one and yes, they had a lot of followers, but they didn't give me a whole lot of love. And so I was like, I'd rather work with people who aren't as well known, who are hungrier mm. to post everything because if they're posting a lot, even if they only have like 5,000 followers, so many more are going to see that versus somebody with 50 who posts once and maybe tags once. Mm. And then, and then that's it. I've had very famous people and they've tagged me once and I'm like, well, and I paid them a lot of money and wow. then I don't really get a lot of kickback from it. Sure. I get the name, you know, which I guess in our industry, we put a lot of precedence on, but now I'd rather work with an unknown florist who's really hustling and ready to go and, and ready to put that work and effort into market the shoot than a florist who's doing me a favor, who makes me a bouquet and is never really going to post about it, you know? So, yeah, that is so interesting. And again, I think, you know, people can look, try and look for the for the highest in the in their field. To, but actually, you're saying if you look for someone who's got around 5000 followers and, and yeah. has got, so do, how do you how do you gauge beforehand that they are going to be this this type of person who's invested are there things that you ask them to make sure that they that they're on board with this idea or do you just get a vibe from them no I have a list of expectations I'm yeah, like this brilliant. is how the marketing campaign works I and I just bring them on board usually people are very excited that somebody knows how to market in the creative yeah. field because what I'm realizing is most people don't so I'm like hey guys this is the marketing plan with the creativity we're going to do. Mm -hmm. This is how many times I expect you to post about it. We're all going to post about it the same day. We all need to tag each other. Um, if this is not something you can do, do not say yes to this shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And you mentioned before about um, paying people. And I think this is a question that especially people starting out are not really sure how to navigate, like even to approach somebody. Am I paying them for their services? Is this a pay for play? Do you go like, are we, are we just exchanging pictures here? You know, like, so do, do you always pay the vendors who do the collaborations with you? Or do you ever just do it that they're no. getting the pictures? And so then it's just a yeah. arrangement? It's all about your boundaries. So there are some shoots where I know I can pay more, like when I'm doing a workshop because I'm getting paid to teach the people. So it, people who um, have done it, you know, who are higher up, generally they want to be paid. But a lot of times for me, I because I they know I'll get them published. They know I'll get them good images. They're like, Darcy, fine. You don't have to pay me. You know, if it's for a workshop, they more, they more, they're more likely to want to get paid younger, um, brand new people. I've had them pay me. Like I do these shoots in Paris with my workshop and they each shoot costs thousands of dollars. Like I, I spare no expense. And so I, I've had, um, a beaut you know, beautiful, like accessories or florals and they'll pay me because they're getting a deal. I've already paid for the model. I've already got the locations. I know Paris like crazy. They know I have dress access. They know I'm paying for the hair and makeup, like for them to pay me a thousand dollars. And I guarantee them like 30 shots or something really great, mm -hmm. um, that they can use. Plus they get to be part of the shoot. It's, it's great. Like that's, I, I would highly suggest. So there are times when I charge, there are times when I don't charge, there are times when I pay. Um, I just, I just have the conversation with people and there are some people who, um, will only do it if you pay them. And 
I just gauge and see if I can afford it or not with that, you know, or would I rather find somebody hungrier who wants to create? Because a lot of the time, the price, you know, the, the, I don't know why, and I don't think it's always fair for the styled shoot. It all falls on the shoulders of the photographer. Mm -hmm. I get really tired of having to pay for the model and pay for the hair and makeup artist. Mm -hmm. And then I have to, and then I'm supposed to pay for the stylist who is actually benefiting from all the work that I'm paying with. So I, um, I think it's a little messed up and I think it's too much rests on the photographer for all the stuff that happens for the florist and the stylist and all of this. So, um, I like a more equal thing. So I try and do more collaborative and say, Hey, I'm, I'll pay for the models. If you pay for the flowers, I'll pay for the film. This is how much it's going to cost. Um, if you know, I've had people florist who, if it's their idea for the shoot, then, Maybe I come in and they just pay me for film. So anyway, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things. I don't like that the price always rests on the shoulders of the photographer. And I would, I have started having a lot more conversations with stylists about like, Hey, let's really talk about what benefit you're getting here and me. And so, yeah. So I don't know. Stylists don't be mad at me for that, but I do think it's unfair how much photographers have to shoulder everything. Like for example, we did a shoot, borrowed two dresses. I got the dresses for free with my reputation, you know, and then it, it got ripped during the shoot by no fault of anything. Everybody's there. It was a $700 fix. Guess who got stuck with the bill? Even though everybody else just got to come in, get the photos. You know what I mean? So we have to yeah. shoulder a lot of responsibility. So yeah. I like, this is why relationships are so important because then you can just have these conversations, um, with people and, and talk it through and good people will help you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want to be the person that's like, oh my gosh, we all benefited from this. Let's all chip in 150 bucks and pay for the dresses. Like that's, that's the team I want to be on. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And it sounds like, um, you know, collaborations and shoots have, have been a central part of your business and your business. success. Yeah. And I, I love what you said that, you know, about marketing your shoots. Cause I think like you said, people can often put, or photographers can put a lot of effort into producing styled shoots. Then they, they market it once and then they go about making another styled shoot. And they just yeah. keep doing the cycle. Whereas yeah. you've got your style shoot. And then for another year, you said, or, or I think it might have even been longer. You two. said that two years that, you, that you're marketing that same shoot. So actually the energy that you you saved by not um, not planning another styled shoot, you put that energy into marketing the work you already had, which is just good use of time. That's efficient. And so yeah. <laughs> I think people should do like two big shoots a year, go right. all out and then market those two shoots instead of doing 10 small shoots that they kind of can't afford. I put in good money to the shoots that I do, but I don't do them very often. Right. Um, I do like maybe if I'm doing the Paris workshop, so the Paris workshop has four shoots in it. And then I usually do one other workshop. So next year in May, I'm doing a New York and that has three shoots. So that will be a big marketing campaign and, and then I'll do a Paris one, you know? So yeah. yeah, now at home, I'm doing a big one just by myself, which cause of COVID at the end of the month. Um, but I haven't shot like all year. I've just been reusing yeah. all, all my past shoots and marketing those. So yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, you just got, and I, the one thing I wanted to ask you, um, was but do you, with your style shoots, do you try and work with new vendors so that you can, you can diversify your reach, um, as, as you're collaborating, or do you stick with vendors that you know are trustworthy so that you don't have, you know, issue, unexpected issues and conflicts with them? Yeah. I mean, you can tell a lot about an Instagram account. Sometimes I've had, I have been mistaken. Um, hair and makeup artists. I like to work with similar ones because I don't want a heavy look and I don't want any like overly done. Like my, my style and aesthetic is very light and romantic. So I, I do like to work with similar, but you know, I've had, I took a chance on one last year in Paris and it turned out to be amazing. And she was so good and hi Brandy, if you're listening. And, um, 
I'm like, you're in, what else do you want to do? Like, let's collaborate. So I like to be really open, uh, because I think magic can come in. I love meeting new people. So it's really a good balance. And at the very beginning, I remember I teamed up with this florist who lived in my town and she was growing her business and we collaborated a lot and got great publications on one sweat. And that was really awesome. And then we worked together in Paris. And so So it's both, right? It's both. It's like, keep those people that you grew with and that you both, you know, you can do a lot when you find a good partnership and you can get really creative and you can start to read each other's minds. And I love that. And then you can be really open, but don't say yes to someone just because you feel guilty. Oh, yeah. I've I've had people like push me hard, like, hey, use my product. And I just know it wasn't my style. And, and, and I have made mistakes in that before where I said yes to something because I was trying to be nice, but I didn't actually vibe with their design. Mm -hmm. And then the photos of it weren't great. And then they weren't happy. And it just, you know, you got to not do that. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. And I think that that's one of the things that you learn as, as you learn, like you said, your boundaries and, and finding out who you are is that is the, the confidence to say no when you know it's not right for you, even if you feel like it's going to make you look bad or somebody's totally. going to be cross with you. You know, you just you just can't afford to give yourself that stress. Um, and I think that you said that that can actually hold back your your dreams and your. And plans. it's hard because sometimes people yeah. ask you in person. <laughs> I go to a lot of workshops and I teach at a lot of conferences and I'll have people ask me in person, will you use my product? And it's like, and I always just tell people, I don't make these kinds of decisions in a conversation at a conference because too much is going on. So email me and we'll talk. I just, so don't feel pressure to say yes or no right then. Even if you know it's a no, sometimes I know it's a no, but yeah it's really hard to do that to somebody's face and you got to give them props for asking. And sometimes I've said to people, you know, if people ask me, why is it a no? I just say, you're not there yet. Like in my vibe, but you, it could be a yes next year, you know, like go do this or, you know, if you want my honest feedback, I'll give it. So I, I make sure I work in alignment with my aesthetic and that's the thing. Women need to be really open to hearing feedback to why it's not a fit instead of getting offended and thinking women immediately want to think they're not good enough and they'll make up all these stories and they'll think like they should quit their job and that it's not ever going to work. And it's, it's not about that, but it is about learning to grow and learning that, you know, you may have some more work to do to get to a certain aesthetic. And if you're open to hearing it, you know, I've told florists, like, I just don't work with these flowers. They look cheap to me. And there's a lot of them in your work. So if you use like hydrangeas and eucalyptus and like these little things, some flowers are a big no to me. Any purple flower is a big no. Right. And so they might not see that and they might think you're pompous. I don't know, but you're, you have a right to your aesthetic. And if, if people, if we could all get better at hearing feedback, I'm very good at feedback. I'd, I'd much rather hear, um, the why so that I can get better. Right. Instead of being too sensitive to get the feedback. I love that. And I, I think that's one of the things that I've grown in personally as a, as a person too. I think before I was focused on niceness, being a nice person, and I wanted people to be nice to me. And now I value truth. I just want to know, yes, tell me, me as it is, and I will tell you <laughs> as it is. Do you know? and, then, and then at least yeah. we all know where we stand. <laughs> it, you just get so much done when oh, you so do true. that. And you do not have you do not, you, you are not as emotionally tired. When I hire my team, I tell them like, I don't want to have to spend extra energy phrasing things in a way that you might not get offended at. I just want to say like, nope, do it this way. Cause my team is like making graphics and I want to, I don't want to have to say, um, okay. So if it's okay, could you just maybe, I think maybe this color just needs to be a little different. No, I want to be like, change this, 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 and that way and go do it. And they're like, okay. You know, I I tell them all the time. I don't want to use my emotional energy Mm -hmm. coddling any feelings. If you can't take feedback, this is not the job for you. (laughs) 
I love that. But like you said, that's just efficient and, and it means that everybody knows where they stand and, and everything is clear. So I love that. So you obviously have a very strong aesthetic when you're planning these shoots. And um, so I had two questions. I wanted to know how you keep having inspiration for new shoots, you know, um, a couple of times a year, you said, or some of your workshops have four shoots. You know, how how do you keep yourself, where, where does your inspiration come from so that it's not just the same kind of shoot every single time? Mm. Inspiration comes from everything for me. I just live a very inspired life. Like I said, it starts with my house. Yeah. I have beautiful paintings I've collected from all over the world. The mug that I drink out of, I have like two of my favorites. One was this handmade one in Japan and one is from a ceramicist friend. And it's very like, I find inspiration in my mugs. <laughs> I find I like, I find inspiration in my linen bedding. I just, it's just a way of living and just being very curious structures. So even though I'm photographing wedding dresses again and again, um, I, ha I have like this screenshot of this structural wedding dress on my computer right now. I'm looking at because I just sent that to my right hand woman, Cassie. And I'm like, let's try and source a dress like this because it's just structurally really interesting. Um, I get endlessly fascinated by hum human humans, yeah. their features, their lips, their eyes, how they move, how the female body curves. So I am photographing the same thing again and again, yeah. but I'm always inspired by it. How fla flowers like a poppy is the most beautiful thing in the world. You just can take an iPhone of a poppy and you get like a million likes because everybody just finds inspiration in life, in nature. Mm -hmm. I travel a lot. So even if I'm doing weddings, it's like a Paris wedding is so different than in a, a Tuscan countryside wedding versus the cliff sides of Ireland versus the busy streets of New York on Fifth Avenue, which I've done many weddings in New York and I love it versus upstate New York in these quaint little towns. It's all about storytelling. So I read a lot of stories. I watch a lot of good TV that have really compelling characters and stories and I try to tell really good stories. So yeah. I love that. So do you feel that you actually are almost telling a story through your styled shoot? Can you talk me through that? Like how, how you actually insert a story into a styled yeah. shoot? Yeah. So actually this is what my new course is, which is selling like hotcakes because it's on sale, but it's called the profitable portfolio and it mm -hmm. teaches detail by detail. You want feedback? Like I have a 40 minute training video just on how, how to photograph fingers and hands. Cause most wow. people chop them off or they crop them in weird ways, or they'll have the death grip on the bouquet and it just does not add this beautiful sense. So for me, it just kind of comes down to being the director. And I got my master's degree in film and directing. I directed plays and small scale little movies before I was a photographer. So you just have to become the director. And the more you understand the director creates the story, the director, like we see a movie and we think it's the actors. No, as soon as you yeah. become a director, like I thought I wanted to be an actress. I like, since I was three, I was telling my parents, I'm going to be in drama. And the more I was in plays and the more I acted, I realized I want to be the one calling the shots. Like I, I want to be the one who directs the actress and gets that emotion out of her or directs the actor and gets that emotion out of him. I want to call every detail of how every scene should look. You know, you look at like Wes Anderson films, like he, we, it's who, whoever famous he has in that, it doesn't matter. He has made every decision and I just really like making the decisions. I like creating different aesthetics. So my course is all about how to become that director, how to pose better, how to see the vision better. There are certain things that you don't know you're missing right now. One of them is probably how you're photographing the bouquet. You probably don't understand how you, you know that you're cropping toes off or you're cropping angles at weird places, but aesthetically, you know, your images don't look as good as somebody who's been doing it for a while. Yes. Even the framing around like how much space I have from foot, like in a portrait to end of the photograph is important. I always like have a measurement in my head. I have studied this for years. So it's all about being 
very directorial and not just leaving things to chance and thinking, oh, I hope my couple has chemistry so they can just like hug and kiss and you don't really know how to direct them. No, that's why I love watching movies by really powerful directors who have a very strong aesthetic. Um, Terrence Malick, for example, if anybody has seen one of his movies, like there's so much about angle and light Mm -hmm. and placement and, and, you know, Wes Anderson's all about symmetry and yeah, I love it. It's one of those things, I suppose, once you, once you start seeing it, you just see it everywhere, like movies, you know, you're noticing. Exactly. thinking yeah so but that's our job as a photographer it's not just about to get pretty pictures of people hugging and maybe looking sweet on their wedding day it is to orchestrate a beautiful collection of fine art images it is to create their story through still images that's why I go early to the venues to find symmetrical locations to read the light I just shot my first wedding in a long time last Sunday it was a very big religious Indian ceremony and I went by the day before and scouted out what I was going to do. And then I drove up into the mountains and scouted out where I was going to take them for their formals. It's extra time, but any good director is going to do that. I love that. And you mentioned about getting the best out of the couple. Have you got little go-to things that you do to actually not leave it to chance, as you say, but actually to, to inspire this chemistry between them? Yeah. I mean, I do have little stories that I tell everyone. I have a couple jokes that I know always get a laugh and I make sure they're in the right pose so that it has this very authentic laugh. I think knowing the couples. So some of my couples, I have photographed weddings in Japan and in Japan, they're not going to kiss and be super romantic. Mm-hmm. I, it's just not a cultural thing thing. So one, knowing the cultural background of your couple, knowing the traditions, my Indian couple, again, in India, if you watch Bollywood movies, there are no kissing. Okay. It just doesn't happen. So my Indian couples don't want to kiss so much for for photos. So that way I do more traditional poses, but I work a lot on like the background and then they can still have a lot of chemistry without that go-to thing. American couples want to just like do piggyback rides, which I sort of don't do because I tend to have a more luxury clientele that doesn't, I don't do the young hipsters, right? Where they're just like flipping their hair around and they're piggybacking and they're running up a mountain. No, that that's not my couples. So I think knowing your couples, mine tend to be lawyers and doctors and they need a lot of subtle direction. So I'll even, I'll compose it even down to their chin. So I do a lot Mm -hmm. of subtle directing, like, Hey, just drop your chin a little. All right, move in. Great. Now you two do this or something. I know that people do lots of prompts, like walk up this hill and tell each other why you love each other. I don't make them do any of that. (laughs) I feel like if somebody asked me that I'd be a little stressed out. (laughs) So I don't want to make them do all these like prompts and stories. Um, But I do make them send me a picture of themselves after they've booked me. I like to see their height differences. I like to see their body differences. Who's cur? Are they curvy? Are they skinny? Uh, I like to take a look. I, I have them send me their five favorite photos of themselves because that gets me in their head. So I see And then I ask them, why did you like this? And it's interesting because the woman will say something like, well, I really liked my smile, but don't get me from the side because I don't like my nose or something like that. And that's a common one. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's, it's really helpful to just get inside their head a little bit. That is so helpful. And so I also wanted to ask you because you, you obviously have a very, well, you, you're very hot on branding. And so you insert your branding criteria into a styled shoe and you've got a very strong director's way of looking at things and, and you enjoy putting it together. Some people listening here, I think, may not have developed that skill yet or not have the confidence in it yet, or maybe that's just not their natural, their skills. So what what would you say are the main ingredients to put into a branding photo shoot and the dream shots, you know, that, that you would want to get? Are you talking a shoot where they're getting photographed, like for their brand? Or I mean, shoot that where they're organizing, yeah, to get, to get um, organizing. for their portfolio, for their own portfolio. Right. It all starts with a mood board and it starts with your own intention. So again, coming back to know thyself, what do you enjoy photographing? Are you epically romantic and want lots of, lots of layers? Are you more minimalist? I tried some minimalist things and 
they were okay, but I really love luxurious roses and dresses with a lot of frills. And I love romantic hairstyles and I love long veils. So it starts with knowing what you like. Um, and then how can you put a twist on it? You know, we're, I'm doing a Christmas shoot, kind of a holiday shoot. And one of the women is going to represent a poinsettia. So we're trying all these different things of like, okay, we take this one inspiration of this poinsettia. Where can we get this red dress? Do we create a headset that has poinsettias? And, and we found this fabric actually that had a big poinsettia on it. And, and we're going to like put it around her face. You can't really see what I'm doing, but we're going to, we're going to kind of cover her face with this poinsettia. And it's like, it could go wrong or it could go cool. I'll have a backup too. Um, but that's, that's the thing is like, know what you like and then figure out when you're doing your own personal work, how to do something edgy enough that you couldn't do at a regular wedding day. So at a regular wedding day, nobody's going to let me put a scarf around their face and try and work on their profile shot and getting these like interesting shadows, right? That's just not going to happen. That's why you have to do it in your personal work. Because if I only shot weddings, I would get very bored because the wedding day is very much the same. <laughs> and I have to up my game within the realm of beautiful women and beautiful dresses and a very romantic look. Um, I still want to do something different when I'm doing my own shoot that with, that's risky enough that it's a risk I couldn't take doing a wedding day. Cause you should get all your wedding shoots from your weddings and then you need to do something interesting so that you can attract people to you mm -hmm. because there's way too many wedding photographers. We already know this. There are way too many pictures of brides. That's why I don't put a ton of my brides and grooms on my Instagram. To be yeah. honest, I put a lot more of my personal work because it's a lot more interesting because I can take a lot more risks. I love that. And I know that one concern that, um, that I've heard before about putting styled or make or making your styled shoots, the bulk of your branding is that people worry that the pressure is then on to create images like that on a wedding day when you might not have control over the elements as much yeah. as you would. Do, do you ever feel that pressure? Do you ever worry about that? Or do, how do you manage that? Well, again, it just comes back to having a conversation with your bride. So I ask them, do you want these kinds of shots? If you do, it's going to take more time. I have had couples yes. who do want that. So I remember this one Greek Orthodox wedding I did and, and, the, and they couldn't see each other before they walked down the aisle. It's just a very strong tradition mm -hmm. and they don't do that. So they just booked a day after shoot got back into their wedding clothes in the afternoon and we did a ton of stuff. They wanted this beautiful rose thing around them while they were laying on the ground. So I had to get this ladder and like, so we just spent four hours composing the editorial artistic images without the pressure of the wedding day. So you just, it's again, it's a conversation and, um, that's, I, I talk very deeply with my brides and my grooms before the day. So we're very clear on our shot list. We're very clear of if we're adding in something uh, a lot more editorial, if they want something, you know, kind of out there, then we talk about it. And some of my brides have, like they really will go for it. And I just need the time and I need to know it's happening and I have to prepare. <laughs> I love. And that. you know, I can, I can do things on the fly too, if they want, but I, I really have the conversation with them because sometimes I'll get very traditional couples who don't want to do it. And I just need to know because I tried to do, I remember this was early on in my career. I tried to do all these artistic poses with this very traditional couple. And when I got the feedback, they were like, why is everything cropped weird? Why are, why is part of my face cropped off? Why what, do I just have one photo of me just looking, you know, and I didn't take enough of just the traditional ones that the grandparents and the parents all want to put on their mantle. It's like the prom pose. And I didn't give them enough options of that. And I, I really had to learn on that wedding that I've got to have better, better communication because I messed that one up. Yeah. That is being I, way I, too artsy and not traditional enough. So yeah. it's a good balance. I think, I think we've all been there definitely. And I think, you know, I say my learned very early on to take my safe shots that I just know just, plain and then get then get artsy and creative totally. after that. So that's so good and we're running out of time I feel like I could talk to you forever Darcy but Aww. I really want to talk to you because I know that one of the topics you like to talk about is self-love and body positivity and that's something we've not discussed on the podcast before but I think that will affect uh, you as a as a creative if you 
because I think I think you can't you can't think as clearly as a creative if part of your brain is worrying what will people think of me what are people thinking of me now do you know and mm. the way you interact with your clients as well so can you talk me through your journey of actually ha- ha- your your own self-love journey ah uh, gosh yeah we do need a lot of time I will I'll refer it to a little bit of photography at the beginning of my career I fell into the patriarchal system that all my models needed to be thin and they all needed to have big lips and they all need to have huge eyes and they all need to be willowy. And, um, and I am not that way. If anybody's just listening to this, I'm a very curvy, very tall. And you're gorgeous. Thank you. (laughs) And I take up a lot of space. And, um, I realized like that I was really catering to the world's view Mm. of beauty. And I started this personal series and I started photographing all different kinds of bodies and they were topless. So a lot of women without clothes, I don't put a ton of them on Instagram, but it was a personal series for me, which I really, and I started having conversations with people about their bodies. And I started thinking about my body and I, you know, once I really freed myself of this confinement. Um, like I'm putting on a workshop in New York next year. And one of the models is this beautiful plus size model Mm -hmm. because I don't see that at workshops. We're all Mm -hmm. just like, we're all just doing these thin white women. And that's the whole problem. We're not representing all women. And I want curvy women. I want tall women. I want short women because that's what our brides are. And if all of our work. I've, I've done good at being diverse in my portfolio. I've, I've photographed a lot of different people, but not body diverse. They were all still skinny models, no matter what color they were, they were all skinny models. So it really took me falling in love with my own curves. I will give a shout out to like Ashley Graham. If you guys don't know Ashley Graham, Mm -hmm. she's a model who is freaking stunning. I hope she writes the opening of my book one day, Hunter McGrady, um, the television series shrill. Um, there's so, which was based off of a book by Lindy West. There's so many great things to make us get out of this crazy idea that all bodies need to look one way. And it really came with my feminist journey, my, my journey into leaving a very very traditional religion where the women stayed at home and were the homemakers and the men went to work. Like I really just realized I was a feminist. I, I, you know, I think most women are, even if they don't know it, I believed in equal pay. I believe in the beauty of all women. And so if I was finding inspiration in my own coffee mug, I could find inspiration in all different kinds of bodies and my own as well. And that took a real turn about two and a half years ago where I started to allow myself to get photographed. Mm -hmm. I think photographers have a very hard time with this. We're always behind the camera and then we do not practice what we preach. And so when I start, I started putting on beautiful photo shoots and I was the star Mm -hmm. and that, because most of my life I didn't allow myself to get photographed, which a lot of moms don't do, you know, like Mm -hmm. a lot of women stay out of pictures and I just, refuse to be that woman anymore. And, uh, I have a lot of fun now. I, I do, I just did a Christmas card yesterday with my two puppies and bought myself a beautiful green sparkly dress for Christmas. And, uh, I love being in photos and I think it just helps you fall in love with yourself. There's so much to do with self-love. I mean, you really have to work through it's again, it's a mindset shift. It's falling in love with yourself. It's doing practices that we don't teach women to do, appreciating themselves, carving out time for themselves. It comes with your boundaries. It comes with knowing who you are. It comes with realizing your own brilliance, which is something creatives all need to fall in love with because it will make you so much better at your art. It will help you connect with people mm-hmm. more. If you're more connected to yourself and your own body, your art is going to reflect that. So it's, it's a lifelong journey but it's one that we, we can't ignore anymore. We have to fall in love with our bodies, love ourselves and, um, and open up and be, be activists for any kind of fat shaming, 
Mm. any kind of shaming of anybody's body you know yeah. there's a lot of that and I just don't have any room in my life for it <laughs> absolutely I love that that is such a such a good topic to talk about and yeah like I think you know you've made me think um about you know what whether whether my portfolio is body diverse that, that is really yeah. really interesting they're point. not I'll yeah. tell you what all of us we don't have it enough so yeah. so interesting <laughs> we, yeah it's really important for you every woman to be able to see themselves in your images. So yeah. I'm working on that a lot more myself. Yeah, I love that. That is so good. I literally feel like I could just keep talking and talking to you. I feel like there's so much we haven't talked about. And yet, but thank you so much for all of that. That is so helpful. For thank people who you. are listening, um, can you let uh, them know where they can get more information about your profitable portfolio course? And I think it was called the Marketing Map. Um, yeah, so I have a, I have a few. The profitable portfolio teaches you how to shoot, how to see things you didn't see, how to direct, how to really create luxury images, how to understand that luxury mindset. Because I don't know about you, but I grew up very poor, so I didn't really mm -hmm. understand how to talk to people who had a million dollars for a wedding without feeling intimidated. Mm -hmm. So I now shoot million dollar weddings all the time, no intimidation, and I teach everything in that. So. Um, everything can be at my website or my Instagram at Darcy Benincosa. There's only one of me. So if you have the link of how to spell my name, cause it's a little tricky, then, uh, they should be able to find that. And then after you take the beautiful photos, then the marketing map is the course that teaches you how to market them like crazy because most people just only focus on taking the beautiful photos, which you do have to get right before you start to market because you don't want to market bad photos because <laughs> you're only as good as your worst photo out there. But yeah, just DarcyBenincosa.com. Maybe in your show notes, you can just link to the website yeah. where the courses are listed. And I will get you that link to um, that marketing live I did to kind of go more in depth with what you can do with a, a campaign. That's what I call them, campaigns, styled shoot, whatever. It's like in the marketing world, they call them marketing campaigns. So that's yeah. what I use. That would be absolutely superb. Well, I, Darcy, that is just so wonderful. You've got so much wisdom and experience. And we're so grateful that you've come and shared some with us and that there's still more. There's still more that people can access from you. So much more. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining thank us you. and for sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much. It has been a privilege. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can find more interviews, tips and inspiration in the Love Light Fine Art community on Facebook. You can also follow along with each new episode on the Love Light YouTube, podcast and Instagram. And don't forget to visit www.sarahjaneethan.co.uk forward slash love light for information on training, real life wedding workshops and online courses to develop your own fine art photography and connect with more of the clients you love.